Today, last week, the week before, in the election area, lots of talk about bread. Lots of talk about bread. We hear Jesus saying things like this. I am the bread of life. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The bread that comes down from heaven. Lots of talk about bread. And today, lots of talk about the eating of Jesus' flesh. <laughs> okay. What do we do with that? Scholars who commit their entire careers to the study of the Gospel of John say that this is the most difficult passage to wrestle with. Many of them, they've got their educated guesses and they're not really sure. One of the easiest ways, if that's the right word, to understand it is to correlate this with the sacrament of Holy Communion. But really, what does that mean to eat Jesus' flesh? It's not like eating sweet Hawaiian bread for communion. What is this? And where is this bread? I've touched on it a little bit in the children's message. How do we order living bread? There's a, I'm about to give a pizza place near our house some free advertising. Uh, there's a Jets Pizza near our house. I don't think there's a Jets Pizza in the at least that I know. Well, we, we, we're a big, big Rose family, we're a big Jets Pizza fans, and I gotta tell you, this thing is about 10 minutes from our house, tops, and <clears throat> they are so good at what they do. Uh, I'm, I'm not big on delivery. I like to save a little money, so, um, I'm always in charge, I am vice president in our house, vice president in charge of ordering and picking up pizza. And this Jets pizza, they're so good at it. Uh, you order it online, and it says to the minute when your pizza's going to be ready, it's always about 30 minutes. And you go, and you pick it up, and it's always ready. The server, the service is always friendly. These people are good, and let's just call pizza for what it is, at least this pizza, it's real thick, it's bread. It's bread with stuff on it. This place is really good at delivering bread. How do you and I order this bread from heaven? How does that work? I think in order to wrestle with this question, I think we need to acknowledge a couple of things. One is, life is paradoxical and contradictory. Write that down. Life is paradoxical and contradictory. And you and I are called to navigate life. And I looked up the etymology of navigate, just to be reminded. Uh, it's, it was originally a, a nautical term. That's what not navigate means. It, it's, a, it's a ship term originally. And hundreds of years ago, how did these sailors navigate when they were out in the middle of nowhere in the ocean? How did they do it? Stars. Stars. Where are the stars in our lives with which we can navigate and discover and see and experience and feel this bread from heaven that gives us eternal life. And then, now, now, now listen, by the way, if I forget in this message in a few minutes, remind, somebody remind me, I want to tell you my take on eating flesh. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you my take on that. Oh, I'll just do it now, and I don't have to remember. There was a study done years ago. I'm, I'm a graduate of what's known as clinical pastoral education. In order to, I was ordained as a Presbyterian, and in order to be ordained
ordained as a Presbyterian, and, and now the UCC requires as well, I think. But you had to be a graduate of clinical, it's called clinical pastoral education. You basically spend a year of your life as a chaplain. I spent a year of my life, just short of a year, as a chaplain at uh, Luther General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. I was on the intensive care unit. And you spend half of your time on the unit being the patients and doctors and nurses, and then you spend half of your time in group work with other people that are studying to become pastors. It's a life-changing experience. It was fantastic and uh, really harrowing at times. And during my time as a clinical pastoral education student, I, we were required to read a study, a research document. And the research document was this. It, uh, it interviewed patients that had been in the hospital for extended periods of time. And they waited until 10 years uh, after the, the patient had been uh, released from the hospital. So we've got patients in the hospital for extended stays, and then they're released. And 10 years later, this researcher asked them questions, asked 50 of them questions. And one of the questions was, while you were extended stay in the hospital, who came to visit you? Okay? Who came to visit you? And there was an incredible, it was almost 100% that everybody could remember who came and visited them while they were in the hospital. Everybody could remember that. And then the next question on the research document was, what did those people say when they visited you? What did they say? And an incredibly high percentage, nobody can remember what anybody said. What did they remember? I'm going to say an open eye prayer right now for whatever's going on with that side. We pray for health and safety for those who are serving and those who need service. So the people remembered who came, they remembered nothing about what they said. This is my take on the power of the flesh. It's being present. Now there's, for me, there's a negative, there's a negative side of that coin, and it's, it's, it haunts me to this day. It was said by uh, mothers uh, calling mothers. My mother had died, and uh, she was the first one of my parents to die. So, I mean, I had been in, been in hundreds and hundreds of calling hours, but this was my mom. It was my first time with one of my parents, and I was absolutely blown away by the people that came. I was, I, I, I had no idea it would mean that much to me. It was so meaningful. And I also remember a few that did not come, who should have. And I'm not proud of that, but it's there. And I believe it speaks to the power of the flesh. This is my take on what Jesus was saying, was when you, air quote, eat my flesh, it means I'm present, I am with you. The power of presence. Okay. Um, what does that mean? What is it? What is this bread, this eternal bread that comes down from heaven? Life is paradoxical and contradictory. Here's, here's what I think it means. Many years ago, I was leading a uh, mission trip, a youth mission trip from our church. About 25 high school kids, five adults, and me. I was in charge. And we went to a Papago uh, Native American reservation in southern Arizona. And on this reservation, they had a small Presbyterian chapel. And we went to the reservation for a week. And we did good works. And after a week of doing good works, then we were going to be tourists. And so we had two, uh, three church vans. And we drove from almost the border of Mexico all the way up to the Grand Canyon. And uh, all of that, of course, is in the state of Arizona, 
when we left the desert, this was August, it was over 100 degrees, and when we went to bed that night in the Grand Canyon in our tents, it was it snowed. How many states can that happen in the <laughs> I'll never forget that. Um, the next day we decided we were going to take a hike. We were organized. I used to say to the group, uh, and the name of our church at the time was Riverside Presbyterian Church, and I used to tell them constantly, remember now, we are a Riverside Presbyterian Church on wheels. We are a community. That's what churches are, faith community. So we got organized, and we decided that we were going to hike, and if you've ever done this, you can hike down the Grand Canyon, and about at a halfway point, there's kind of a little oasis down there. I forget the name of it. I do remember the name of the path. It's called Bright Angel Path. Bright Angel Path. And so I was the leader, I was in charge, and I was in control. That's foreshadowing. <laughs> I was in control. I knew what I was doing. I made sure where all the kids and all the parents had their backpacks with food and water. We were in control. And what I found out was walking down, life is contradictory and paradoxical. Life walking down was good. And I was in control. Walking down is easy. And we got down there and we took our little break. We, it was about two hours or so, as I recall, walking down. And then we started walking up. <laughs> Not just this guy from the Midwest. I had never walked up like that before. <clears throat> and life is paradoxical and contradictory. And I was, the more we walked up, the less I felt in control. And the more life was a challenge. Has anybody here ever been challenged by life? And whenever we're challenged, that's when we really need to be aware of the possibility of this bread from heaven, this eternal life that lives within us. And then, as things will often do, things weren't really that bad, but they got bad. Because one of the adults that was on the trip, I didn't know this, but she pulled me aside. I, I don't think I'd ever heard the word before. She pulled me aside and she said, Jay, I'm really struggling. I have lupus. I still don't know much about lupus, but I, but I do know this. It mattered that day. And she said, I, I just, I've got to stop. And so, myself and, a couple, myself and one other adult, we quickly made alternate plans, and her name was Bev, and we, just, we said to Bev, we'll walk with you, we'll wait with you. And why did we do that? <clears throat> it's not because we're really wonderful people, it's because we were part of a community, a faith community, and you don't abandon people. So we waited with Bev. And she had to stop every hundred yards or so. And the rest of the group went on. And pretty soon we were out of water, out of food. Obviously it was never life threatening. But we were hungry. We were hungry. Slowly we got closer to the top. Slowly we got closer to the top. And I looked up. I saw three of our high school kids walking towards us, carrying food and water. And I didn't realize we were that close to the top. We, we were just a thousand yards or so from the top. And one of them was carrying uh, three pieces of bread. This was bread in the form of hot dog buns. <laughs> and inside the hot dog buns were hot dogs. And we ate. We ate. 
And I get teared up thinking about it, and it's not because of just eating those hot dogs, it was because of what, because of the people and the members and being part of a faith community. Life is paradoxical and contradictory. And the eternal bread of life that gives us eternity is available to us in people, in places, in things, in music, in a good novel, anywhere and everywhere. I will leave you with this. A loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and that. That was written, and this kind of blows my mind, in the 12th century. That was written in the 12th century by Omar Khayyam, who was the Persian mathematician, astronomer, philosopher, and poet. Let me read this. A loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and now is a phrase from stanza 12 of Omar Khayyam's book of verses underneath the bow. The phrase has come to represent a powerful image of the good life, reminding us to appreciate the simple pleasures, find joy in everyday moments, and cherish the connections that we have with others. And I will change that just a bit. I will say it's reminding us to appreciate the simple pleasures and to find the eternal living bread of Christ in everyday moments. A loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou. Amen? Amen.